Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. It is a, not only a beautiful day, it's an extremely warm day right here on the Mount of the Beatitudes. We've taped here over the years many times, and I always make a joke when we return to the Holy Land or to Israel and begin to do our manifest telecast. We tape in so many of the same locations uh, many times over the years that people want to know, is it a rerun? You can tell by this shirt, it is not a rerun. <laughs> we always go and buy new shirts every year so that you will know it's a brand new program from the same location. So anyway, uh, this morning at the hotel, I was preparing to uh, know that we knew we were going to be around the lake, around the Sea of Galilee this morning. And I really wanted a, a special word for everyone. I, br I always bring about 40 to 50 outlines with me and sometimes nothing clicks. And so uh, I was going to, this is our, our New Testament study Bible over here on page 18. I was going to it this morning reading from Matthew and I saw a note that was made. And I'll just show you this. This is a chart. This will come on the screen, I think. We'll get this on the screen for you in a moment. And there's something in uh, theology. When I was taking courses from Lee College years ago, there's something in the four gospels called the synoptic problem. And the synoptic problem is this. Many scholars believe that the very first of the four gospels was written probably by Mark. And uh, Mark, of course, in our English translation has 16 chapters. And some of the other writers uh, took some of the stories of Mark and repeated them. And one of the things is, if you've noticed, that you will have certain stories in the New Testament that all the gospel writers talk about. Uh, Luke adds some uh, in incidents or narratives that some of the others do not add. Uh, John will also add some narratives that the other gospels do not add. So it wasn't an exact copy per se. But there is a really unanswerable situation or unanswerable narrative that is found in Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 5. And I'm going to call this message Satan's Open Door Policy. And I want you to follow with me because if you read the Bible and don't pay attention, you've never caught this. If you read it carefully and you compare Scripture with Scripture, you have caught this. And this is one of the synoptic problems. And we're going to try to explain what actually happened here. There is a story of where Jesus is in a boat and he goes to the other side of the sea and he comes into the land of the Gergesenes or the Gadarenes, as one writer says it. And suddenly he is met by a man that has unclean spirits. And most of you know the story how the man was possessed by a, a, a devil whose chief, the chief spirit within him was called Legion. And the name Legion came from Roman, a, the Roman legions. A Roman legion was 4,800 soldiers up to 6,000 soldiers. And because there were many spirits possessing this one man's physical body, the head demon that Jesus spoke to within the man's body, now of course the demon was using the man's voice when speaking to Jesus, uh, said, my name is Legion. And that's because of the number of spirits that were there. What I want to do is show you the problem of Mark chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to delve into this for the next few moments, all right? Because uh, one of the things that always struck me is that there were more spirits that Jesus encountered in this area than he did, for example, in Jerusalem or he did in any other area. And so in my research over 40 years of ministry, I began to uh, question a little bit about, you know, wh what was there about this? What was there about Jesus? What was there about this area that caused so many spirits to be here? And the answer is this, Jerusalem was a religious center. There was the Torah, there were the prophets. The biggest thing Jesus dealt with there was not demons, it was religion. Some religions are demons, you understand? <laughs> You've met some Christian people that uh, could be in the Bible stories. I won't, go, I won't go any further than that. I'll just leave that alone. But his, he dealt with religious tradition, customs versus tradition, traditions that were trying to counter the word. So that's what Jesus dealt with in Jerusalem. One of the reasons I believe that Jesus dealt with so many spirits here is this was the Galilee of the Gentiles. And I want you to notice the location directly behind me, uh, of course, not close, but up for many, many miles up the road is Lebanon. Directly in this direction is Syria. 
And you had what was called the Decapolis that started in Syria and went all the way down through this area along the lake, all the way down to the Jordan Rift. And in the Decapolis area, there were 10 cities. And these cities had uh, different kinds of Greek and Roman influence. And the Greeks and Romans were very heavily into idol worship. And anytime you have a country or a nation that is very steeped in idol worship, you will have demonic activity, extreme demonic activity. And I'm not going to name the nations because this message goes everywhere, but there are nations in the world that worship thousands of idols. And anytime you have false gods, you have a heavy release of uh, sicknesses, diseases, demonic spirits, depression, oppression, and all this weird paranormal activity that takes place. Jesus encounters a man that has 2,000 demons, and it's in this land of the Gadarenes. Now, the tribe of Gad, as you know, Jacob had 12 sons, and in those 12 sons, Gad is one of those tribes. And the tribe of Gad was in this direction here. Now, every three times a year, according to the book of Exodus, the men of Israel, all over 20 years of age, were to come up to the city of Jerusalem to worship the Lord. And when they came up to worship the Lord, obviously Judah and Benjamin were right there. But when you get to Gad and Manasseh and you get to the others, you get, to, you get some of the tribes that lived far away from the temple. A group of two and a half tribes, after Moses' death, after they conquered the promised land, according to your Bible, went across the Jordan River and lived on the other side of the Jordan River, meaning, and don't miss this, meaning that when they had to go up to worship, they had the furthest distance to go. Now, you know, like I do, that if you have church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, the people that live closer will come to all three services. The people that have to drive an hour may not come but Sunday morning. Now, now track with me because you're going to see something here. So what happens is, I think that, in fact, in the Bible, those tribes built an altar, if you'll remember, then the other tribes came up and were just irate because they were not to copy the altar they were not to build another altar like the one at the tabernacle. So they said, these tribal leaders said to um, the men of God and the Levites, we did not do this to offer sacrifices. We did it as a memorial to remind our children about the Lord. So they let it go. The point is that over time, some of these tribes were not close to the presence of God and when you're not close to the presence of God, demons get comfortable. Yeah. Woo, did you hear that? Amen. So this area was an area where demons could be comfortable because there were pagan ideas, pagan worship, idols, all of that was in the air involvement with the Gentiles. Now, I want to go back and show you Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 5, and there'll be a chart that'll come up on the screen. Matthew 8, verse 28, Jesus came to the other side of the sea. Mark 5, verse 1, Jesus came to the other side of the sea. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus came to the land of the Gergesenes. Mark chapter 5, Jesus came to the land of the Gadarenes. It's actually the same area, okay? There's no difference in the area. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28, Jesus came near the tombs. Mark chapter 5, verse 2, Jesus came near the tombs. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, two men came out to meet him. Mark chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, one man came out to meet him. Synoptic problem. Two men or one man. Now follow me. The demons were tormented by Christ, Matthew chapter 8, verse 29. Look at Mark chapter 5. The demons were tormented by Christ, Mark 5, verse 7. The demons called Jesus the Son of God, Matthew chapter 8, verse 29. The demons called Jesus the Son of God in Mark chapter 5, verse 7. There were, there were a large number of swine, and these would have been wild boar. They actually are up here in this area, in different areas. We've seen them before, not here, but in the, in the uh, Golden Heights area. So there's a large number of swine in Ma Mark chapter, I'm sorry, in Matthew 8, verse 30. Mark chapter 5, verse 11, there's a large number of swine. Matthew chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, the demons entered the swine and drowned. Mark chapter 5, verse 13, the demons entered the swine and drowned. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 34, the townspeople begged Christ to leave the area. Mark chapter 5 verse 17, the townspeople begged Christ to leave the area. Now, the synoptic problem is this. Everything in Mark is found in Matthew except one difference. Matthew says there are two men possessed Mark says there's one man possessed. 
and they're possessed with the same amount of spirits. Now, if scholars for 1800 years or 1700 years have looked at this and cannot give you the answer other than, this is their answer, somebody made a mistake in the manuscript. That's their answer. If scholars who have debated this for centuries can't come up with the answer, it's going to be very difficult for me to look at the camera or look at you and come up with an answer, right? I mean, it is. It's going to be difficult. But I'm going to give you a strange possibility. Are you, re you ready? Everybody say, I'm ready. ready. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Luke chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. Y'all, excuse me. I could quote it, I think. 11, verse 24 through 26. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finding none. And he says, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he, when he cometh, he finds it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there so that the last state of the man is worse than the first. Now, what this is saying, and this is the Lord speaking, is that when someone has been delivered from strong demons, that those spirits will leave that person, but then try at some point to go back into them. Now, how do they go back into them? If the person is redeemed, uh, covered by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit, that is the barrier and wall that keeps those spirits from coming back. But if, it's just, if the person is just temporarily swept and garnished and the house is not filled, does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe they've made a decision, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do the right thing, and they shut the door, there's the, there's the key, they shut the door on the enemy so that the enemy is not able to move in. But then as a, a month or two goes by, this same spirit starts coming back around. Now, I'm going to illustrate this to you that people who have been, let's say, very heavy alcoholics and they get delivered will tell me seven years later that they started getting the taste back. Just out one, they woke, I'm, I've had people at OCI tell me this. I went years, I smoked dope real heavy and I went years and I woke up. A girl told me this the other day that was one of our young people. Two years to three years, totally free from all drugs and woke up for no reason tasting marijuana. And I said, you know, that's that spirit that had you in addiction. She was an addict, uh, drug addict, and it's trying to bring a taste back. Okay, it's very strange. People say that with tobacco, they say it with alcohol, they say it with hard drugs, that they'll go through this long time. Now what's happening, I'm not saying that everybody that has an addiction has a spirit, that's not what I'm saying, but there are times that people that have had real heavy addictions, a spirit has motivated that. So what I'm saying is the spirit tries to immediately go what? Back into the place. All right, let's go back to, let's just stick with Mark for a moment, Mark's gospel, that one man has 2,000 demons in him, all right? The Bible says that when the demons came out, they left the man and they had nowhere to go and they go into the swine. And then it says that the swine ran down a steep place into the sea and were drowned. Now, demons can't swim. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> What happened was the spirits did not drown with the swine. That's right. Question. Now, don't answer it. Where did they go? Back to the dry arid house from which they went. They Where did they go? Now, stop and think. Now, we just read a verse. They didn't stay in the swine. Okay, now, they've, watch this. They've come out of the man, 2,000 at least. Now, how do we know that? Because there's 2,000 swine. One spirit went into each swine. And the reason the demons could not multiply in their numbers into the swines is swine, swines have no eternal spirit. Oh, you're going to get that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Animals are soulish and flesh, but not spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit because we are a body, soul, and spirit. Our spirit can house the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Or if we're evil, our spirit can house multiple demons. Mary Magdalena had seven demons because she had a human spirit that is a container that can hold them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the pigs don't have that. So one demon had to go into each one, and that's why there were so many swine that drowned. Now, question, when the pigs drowned, where did they go? Answer, seeking someone else to go into. So watch, Jesus is in the same area 
This is, now, this is, this, is a, this is a possible interpretation of the synoptic problem. He's in the same area. One man has been delivered. The 2,000 spirits have gone out of the man into the swine. As they have gone into the swine, the swine have drowned. All this is Bible. But where did the demons go once the, the swine had drowned? Looking into the dry place for somebody else. Here's the possibility. And found two other men in the tombs. And if they found two of the men in the tombs before Jesus could leave the area and get out of the area, then Matthew deals with two men that are possessed. Mark deals with the one man who was the head man that was possessed. And the spirits that were in the one ended up coming into the two, and you had a double deliverance happening at the same spot, same time, same area. Yeah. Now that's possibility. That's a possibility. And... The, the, other, the other thing that comes up in this narrative is that the, the number of swine that it would take to do that, which were, again, wild boar. Now, here's the part that when people came here and they, and they really know the, the Word of God, they put this together one time and they said, wait a minute, Jews don't raise pig. They don't raise pork. But please understand, this, is, this was not the Jewish area. This was the Gentile area. Why were there so many swine in the area? Are you ready? Because the Roman soldiers ate the pork and purchased it from local people. Mm -hmm. So there was literally a huge business in the Gentile region of this area with us. So to have 2,000 swine in that day in a Gentile region of Syria or Lebanon, was not, that would not be considered to be strange or weird. Jerusalem, yes. But because it was a Jewish area, but not the Gentile area. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you for a moment how this operates. And I don't want to tell really weird ooh, do, 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 <laughs> stories, but this really happened. We were having a warrior fest at Omega Center International several years ago. And I remember this, that there was a young man. He happened to be from an Hispanic background, and his uh, sister was there and some of his family was there because we have a great... I'm so glad, I'm just finding this out. We have a huge Hispanic following that watches us on Manifest. And I'm, I'm just so grateful. We're seeing a lot of Hispanic people come to the conferences in Texas, California, uh, when we're in the Midwest especially. All right, now, this, this young man is, is demon-possessed, and he's manifesting. He's not over-emotional. I could tell there was a spirit. And I, I turned to one of our young ladies. I said, I'm tired. Go cast the devil out of him. And she looked at me and said, really? And I said, you have the authority in the name of Jesus, just go do it. When she did, I don't think she was prepared. And that boy grabbed her and literally was physically hurting her. And I just, it made me mad. So now I'm tired and mad. <laughs> That's one thing when I'm angry, but don't get me tired and angry. And I, just, I literally jumped off of the, on, the, on the speaker and jumped to the platform and I, I grabbed him and I said, I command you in the name of Jesus, you found spirit, come out of him. And I mean now. And I pulled the, the old... Some of you know who I'm talking about, my mentor, T.L. Lowry, who had a great ministry of praying with people, incredible, when I was growing up. And T.L. Lowry used to say, devil, I ain't got time for you. <laughs> he would. He would say, I'm not messing with you, and you're coming out. And I just pulled that, and if, I, I probably changed my voice and said it, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that part. But I remember that the boy, just like it, the Bible talks about, collapsed to the floor, and felt, and it looked like he was dead. And all the kids said, oh, is he okay? I said, he's fine. And I grabbed him by the hand and picked him up. And he was crying. He was praying. He was worshiping. Now, here's the weird part. His sister, and I found out later they had been in witchcraft. Both of them had been around witch. That's where the spirit came in. They weren't. So I want you to understand this is not a saved Christian boy full of a devil. This is a kid in witchcraft. Here's the part that gets weird. His sister, there's 4,000 kids there. She's in the back. The demon leaves him and goes into his sister. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but all of a sudden, way back in, the, she doesn't see him. She doesn't know what has happened. He's in the front. She's in the back. So the spirit tried to stay with someone it was familiar with. Got it? And that's what we're talking about in Luke. So the enemy, the enemy, the way that a person shuts the door is what happened with this man. This man, once he was delivered, there's several things he did. Ready? Number one, he is clothed at the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. So he's been delivered. He's in his right mind. 
Now, watch what happens. He wants to travel with Jesus because I believe he was afraid of going home because that's where the demons came on him. And he's thinking, if I go home, what if those spirits come back on me again? And Jesus said to him, go home and tell the great things the Lord has done. Now, here's what the Bible says in Revelation. You overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Now, that's getting your sins cleaned. That's getting forgiven. And by the word of your testimony. And you know what he did? Go to Mark 5 and read what he did. He went and began to publish in the Decapolis all of the miracles that Jesus did for him. I mean, he had scars on his hand. He could say, look at me. They had me chained. Look at me. I cut myself with stones and Jesus delivered me. And he was the first. See, he stayed delivered as long as he told his story. So many people get touched. Well, I don't want to say God had delivered me because what if the devil comes back? He's going to come back if you don't shut the door. And the way you keep the door shut is by testifying, I got the victory. I'm claiming the victory. I'm walking in the victory. I don't care what he said. You have to say it. You have to testify. And in closing, here's the part that's remarkable. Right after he went to the Decapolis, the 10 cities, Jesus comes back here to minister. You ready? and has the biggest crowd he's ever had. <laughs> biggest crowd he ever had. And the reason he has a crowd is that man told everybody, go see this man. <laughs> about to preach right here. Go see this man that delivered me. So you have Jesus Christ, I'll tell you today, is able to free you and deliver you because the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you for joining me today. I hope this has taught you something from the Word. We have a new offer on Manifest. Please stay tuned. We're going to give you something very special in just a moment. Let's give them a praise from the Beatitudes in Israel. Praise God. Ephesians In Depth, The Warrior Strategy is now being made available. Today, with so many spiritual conflicts and personal struggles, this teaching is urgently needed. This series was taped on a set using a Roman-type town with numerous replicas of Roman military equipment. You will experience 12 hours of teaching divided into 23 30-minute lessons on seven DVDs. That's right, seven DVDs. On this landmark series, you will discover how to sit in heavenly places, how to walk by faith, and how to stand in the evil day. Four of the lessons will teach you how to defeat the four types of satanic spirits that you wrestle with in life. You will also learn how a written and spoken word from God becomes a weapon called the sword of the Spirit. You will discover how to renew and restore your shield of faith and even see the various types of shields used during the Roman period. Two lessons will also teach you how to keep your feet from sliding into traps that are set by Satan in secret. Four lessons will reveal the battles that you will fight in the time of the end and a strategy needed to overcome in each situation. You can apply this teaching and it will help you to defeat the adversary in every area of your life. Every piece of Paul's armor will be presented in an exhaustive study. But the best part is that I will show you how to use this protective gear in your daily life. These seven DVDs with 12 hours of teaching, that's 23 distinct lessons, is available during this very special limited time offer. I want to send you this teaching, Ephesians In Depth, The Warrior Strategy, for your donation of only $95 or more. Order by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. Order online at perrystone.org, or if you wish to mail in your request, write Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, and ask for offer EPH. 132. That's EPH 132. Take time to feed your spirit this revelation that I know is going to transform your situation. God bless you. The New Testament was written in the era of the Roman Empire and the Greek culture, which was called Hellenism. And Paul used so many analogies in the book of Ephesians concerning how a Christian should battle the demonic spirits that they will encounter in their lifetime. This teaching I'm making available on the believers, the strategy for battle, the strategy for the end time, the believer's armor is brand new. This is not an old teaching redone with a new cover. This is a brand new teaching. It is seven DVDs. Please get this. It's illustrated. I'm not just standing in front of a camera teaching. I'm showing you things. I'm, there's object lessons. There's history. There's Greek word studies. I'm telling you, I'm excited about this because there is no doubt in my mind, people are going to receive an insight 
that's going to change their situation and change their battle and bring them into a victory with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so please get this today. Let me just mention very quickly, I'm coming to the sanctuary in Deland, Florida, Friday night, two services Saturday and all day Sunday, uh, March the 8th through the 10th. Please join me. No registration fee, no fee to attend. Come as you are. And then Tyler, Texas at New Life Worship Center, Pastor Rudy Bond's church, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, April 5th through the 7th. I remember something funny. The last time we were in Tyler, Texas, an ice storm came on Sunday. And this is Texas, by the way. And we couldn't believe it. My staff couldn't believe it. And we drove to church and over a hundred people came to church in an ice storm. That's going to always stand out in my mind. But uh, you can go to perrystone.org and get our itinerary in more detail for the entire year. And don't forget the Utah meeting, which is coming up in July. You can now register for that. No fee to attend, but you can register for that now. And we mentioned a little, a little last week some things that we wanted to share with you about prayer. And one of the things I, I'm beginning to see, is, as a lot of you know, um, because this has been made known on social media, I will turn 60 years of age, June 23rd of this year, and have, have been in ministry now well for over 40 years. Have uh, total now, and my son said to me one day, said, Dad, can you actually prove that? I said, son, I will sit down with a calculator, show you my itinerary, and ask your mother how much I studied when we were traveling on the road together. But there's about a, over 170,000 hours of Bible study, research, reading. That doesn't mean I just that long in the Bible. Word studies, books, history. Have, I have 25,000 books in my library. Not my books, these are books by other authors. And so one of the things I wanted to do is really, you know, you, one day you're gonna leave this world should the Lord tarry and you leave behind all that information. So, so we're working on compiling that information, putting that information together so that that research does not pass if something should ever happen to us uh, years from now and the Lord should tarry. And um, one of the things we've done, as most of you know, is develop an internet Bible school, iso.org. You can check that out. But um, God has been good to us. I'm going to give him the glory, but we could not do it without so many friends and partners. So thank all of you for keeping Manifest on the air. See you next week. Except that the Word of God is true. We are living in a very prophetic season. This is powerful to think about. He comes back with a sword, not a magic wand. So after all this study, here, this is my conclusion. Let me share with you what this is about. Jesus made it.